So if you watched our last video on how to modify a Toyota 4AG, you probably learned the basics of a very simple, basic street 4AG. Well, today we're going to do something a little more special. Uh, for a customer, we're building a 4AG that can be revved to 11,000 RPM. Now, a lot of these parts that we have here are the parts that the customer spec, some of them anyway, and they're not exactly the parts that we would spec if this was fully our build. Um, and there's a lot of parts that they didn't want to do that we insisted on, but uh, we'll get to that in a bit. So this engine is actually in the 4AG community is what's popularly called a 5AG combo. Uh, it's an 1800cc stroked engine. Now, um, there's a bunch of different lashups of parts to get this displacement. But what we did here is what we feel is the best way to do this and maintain some durability. We started with a 7AFE engine. This is the engine off of a later model Corolla, you know, those front wheel drive boring ones. And these engines are really common, but what we really like about them is they have a much taller deck than the 4AG. And that enables you to stroke yet run a longer rod, so your stroke to rod length ratio stays better. Now, stroke to rod length ratio controls your piston speed and dwell time at top dead center. Now, a lot of engine builders will argue that it doesn't make any difference, and uh, it really doesn't make a huge difference to me in power and torque, but where it makes a pretty big difference is the durability long term of the engine. Now this isn't necessarily street durability, but it's maybe track durability. Now I, I know in our, lot, our last 4AG video, a lot of you were saying that, oh, we're all overkill, but we build our engines so they'll hold up to a customer that does track days, for instance, or does road racing, or actually competes with the car. A lot of these lash up of parts that are popular might be run forever, like 10 years, street, drag strip, whatever. But if you're to actually run a track day, not even a professional racing track day, but just like a regular track day, well, the engine will not be too happy after a few of those. So we tried to build an engine that will hold up for that. The stock stroke to rod length ratio on a 4AG is, um, let's see, I can't remember. It's 1.58 to 1. Now, this is a pretty small rod ratio. Um, your piston speed about top dead center is kind of high. There's a lot of angularity of the connecting rod to the piston, so the piston tends to dig into the cylinder wall. Uh, this accelerates your piston wear. Uh, more uh, rock in the bore on the piston that accelerates your ring wear, ring groove wear. Um, at high RPMs, the uh, piston acceleration away from top dead center is higher, so there's more stress on your connecting rod, piston pin, uh, pin boss in your piston, etc. There's less time for the combustion event to impinge upon the top of the piston and transfer energy. Now, like I said, some engine builders are, find this debatable, but Honda did a lot of research on stroke to rod length ratio, and uh, they're experimenting with a H22 engine. There's an SAE paper on this if you want to research it and buy the paper and look at it. But they went uh, from a small stroke to rod length ratio to a big one, and they found about, I think it's a 12 horsepower difference between a um, small rod ratio and the, and the big one. So, um, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Personally, I don't feel like it makes a huge impact on power or torque, but, um, other 4AG engine builders have found it has some influence, and I find that it definitely has an influence on durability, so it's well worth doing. So when you talk about doing this in the taller deck block, uh, the stock 5AFE has a rod ratio of uh, 1.54 1, 1 to 1. Um, it has a longer rod, but a longer stroke, and the rod ratio is a little worse. But what we're going to do is we're using an OS Geek and Crank. This OS Geek and Stroker Crank is actually a really cool unit. It's made out of billet. It's the Japanese equivalent of 4340, so it's GIS something or other. I 
can't remember all the numbers and all the specs, but basically it's 4340, really good material. Uh, it has like a generous fillets on the uh, crank, so uh, less stress risers. It's fully counterweighted. And what I like about this the most is it uses the uh, same bearing as the SR20. So that's uh, a 48 millimeter um, rod um, journal diameter versus um, the stock 4AG big journal crank, you know, which is on the 20V and the supercharged MR2. Uh, the good one to use is a 42, so it's a bigger, bigger journal. It makes the crank stronger. There's more uh, journal overlap, which also contributes a lot to your crank strength. And um, it gives you a lot more bearing area. So those of you that have built serious high revving 4AGs and, and have road raced them, for instance, have probably fought uh, connecting rod bearing issues. Um, this will probably go a long way to uh, reducing that problem. Uh, so your bearing isn't overloaded. The bearing's not so big that you get uh, bearing speed issues, but uh, it's big enough to hold quite a bit of a load. So maybe that's the best feature of the crank. So the stock 4AG crank is a 77 millimeter stroke. And this crank has a stroke of 85.5 millimeters, which gives you just under 1,800 cc's. Um, the crank is also uh, nitrided finished. So nitriding is um, impinging um, nitrogen to the surface of the steel, so the, it converts the surface to iron nitride, which is a really hard, almost a ceramic kind of material. So this reduces wear. Uh, it's really slippery, reduces uh, friction and windage, uh, really helps with durability. That's this uh, black look to the crank. So when we got the crank, uh, what we did is we chamfered all the oil holes, uh, balanced the crank, and uh, micro-polished the journals um, to reduce friction. I mean, it's kind of like what we do with all our builds, but um, it kind of like does the detail prep, and you can kind of see it. Uh, our micro polish did not penetrate the nitrided layer on the journal, so it's still there nice and hard and protecting everything. Um, I would say this is pretty much good to go. Uh, for uh, the uh, main bearings, we're using ACL. Uh, the ACL bearings are a uh, tri-metal, so they have a layer of... Um, Pretty hard alloy metal. Um, you know, it's usually lead with like tin and other things, indium and stuff like that to make the base harder. Uh, also a high copper percentage. And then the, the top layer is like a uh, softer with a higher lead percentage, so it has some embeddability. The hard bottom layer gives you a load bearing capacity. And then there's like a top zinc layer that kind of just helps it break in. So it's called a tri-metal bearing, which is pretty common for racing uh, bearings with high capacity. Um, so th those are excellent bearings. Uh, we use uh, probably ACL or King in most of our builds. Uh, also Clevite, it depends on what's available for what motor. Uh, all of these are tri-metal type construction. They're all great bearings. I guess the next cool thing is uh, 4AGs have a lot of Oil, oiling issues. Now we really, for this kind of engine, we really recommend a dry sump, but uh, the customer didn't want to use the dry sump, so uh, we didn't, did the next best thing. Uh, basically, we used uh, the Toda oil pump gears. The, the stock uh, gears are like cast steel, and then they break. Um, the, uh, like the 20V and the later supercharged versions are probably good for nine grand and occasional 10 grand, uh, but the, even they'll break. The, the stock regular 4AG um, uh, oil pump gears, they break at about eight grand, um, but the Toda ones should be good for um, you know, the RPM we want to spin. We don't usually recommend this, but that's what the customer wanted. You know, when you're turning 11 grand, you need uninterrupted, unaerated oil, and nothing could be the dry sump for that. But 
Uh, that's not what the customer wanted. This is the next best thing. Um, the oil pump housing, uh, we kind of chamfered and cleaned up the, uh, the ports and passages. And uh, the belt tensioner pivot here um, tends to fall off on really highly modified engines, so we pinned it so it can't fall off. Normally, uh, we'd like to run an MRP tensioner, uh, additional tensioner on the belts, because 4 EGs tend to have really bad belt flap, but that's on back order, so I couldn't show it here, but the engine will have an MRP uh, additional belt tensioner. Uh, that's almost mandatory for a pretty serious 4AG. Uh, the connecting rods are OS Geekin, and uh, like the crank, they're like a 4340 or whatever the Japanese equivalent alloy. Um, they're machined from a uh, near net shape forging. So um, it's not exactly a billet, they, they have a forging. They forge the rod into a near net shape, which gets really good grain flow around the big end and, and in the beam. And then they do a final machining. So that's a pretty cool way to make the rod. Plus they have a high strength rod bolts, which is important. The rod is longer, it's 138 millimeters, and it gives you a rod ratio of 1.61 to one. So not only do you get the stroke, but you get a way better rod ratio. Uh, so this is going to keep your engine internals a lot happier at high RPM. Uh, when you look at the rod, uh, it's also nitrided. It's this slippery black coating, just like the crank. And it's a pretty good piece. And it's all figured out, so you don't have to do any engineering. The rod also has um, a bottom pin oiler and a top pin oiler. Uh, we try to avoid top pin oilers, but the top hole is like very, very small, so I don't think that's going to be an issue. Um, nice piece, strong, good rod ratio. It's off the shelf, and you don't have to figure it out. So uh, that's the advantage. If you want to look at the stock 4EG rod, uh, this is a stock 20V rod, and you can see the difference in size. I mean, it's pretty, pretty considerable. And you can look at the difference in the... Uh, journal size between the 20V and the OS. Um, the interesting thing is, uh, I, I'm not weighing it, but you could, the 20V rod is actually heavier than the OS rod too. So um, this is a win, win, win. Um, everything's good. You don't have to engineer it. You can just buy it and use it. Now the pistons are um, a, another OS part. Uh, they're forged. Um, I believe they're a higher silicon alloy than uh, typical American pistons. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing for a naturally aspirated motor. They're a little bit old school in design, like they're a full face piston, which uh, is worse for friction and maybe it's heavier. Um, they don't have the pressure equalization groove typical of American pistons. Um, you don't have the internal buttressing but you do have some internal milling to hold the weight down. This is kind of like a piston that's maybe 10 year old technology, but I mean, it's not saying it's a bad piston, it's just like not the latest stuff that like a lot of American pistons uh, have. Um, what's cool is it uses um, a very modern uh, ring pack. So it uses uh, thin um, one millimeter rings, low tension, modern materials like a steel top ring that's uh, plasma coated, uh, an iron naper type bottom ring uh, for good sealing and good conformability and quick break in, a thin rail, thin oil ring. So these are modern rings, uh, thin, low tension, low inertia, all really important for when you're spinning at high RPMs because you don't want ring flutter or anything like that, especially when the piston's at about top dead center. So the piston has a slight dome to it, and it has about 12 to 1 compression. And you know, after we do our tricks with the combustion chamber and our porting, it ends up being somewhere in the 11s. Now, this is probably like a max effort street compression ratio. If it was a racing motor, I'd probably do 13 to 1. But um, this compression ratio is kind of high for the street, but it'll run on 
you know, run on 91, and if you're going to go to the track, yeah, you should probably use some octane booster or, or some percentage of race gas, but um, decent all-around compression ratio. So overall, maybe not the pistons we would use, um, maybe not the rods we would use, but uh, it's all solid stuff. Um, you know, it's just kind of like personal preferences between engine builders. Um, you know, it's all good. Uh, for rod bearings, we're using ACL, trimetal, just like the main bearings. Uh, like I said, they're SR20 diameters, so there's a lot more bearing area. Um, so you're not likely to have the bearing problems that tend to plague super serious 4AGs. Uh, all a good choice. Um, for the bottom end, we're doing some uh, really special stuff. Like uh, you probably see in my old videos, I talk about uh, lack of integrity on these 4AG motors, especially if you're spinning them up like above 9,000 RPM uh, for like longer use, like road racing. Uh, you know, like I said in my other video, if you're going to run it on the street or if you're just drag racing, or if you have a turbocharged motor that doesn't rev that high, I mean, you can go a long time with, uh, without doing dire things to the bottom end. But if you're a high spinning, high RPM, naturally aspirated motor, all out turbo motor, uh, you know, all out, um, you know, like other, you do track days, uh, spend a lot of time at high RPM, or you're a serious drag racer and you're tr trying to get everything out of your motor, uh, you need to reinforce the bottom end. And MRP makes this totally cool girdle. Now this girdle ties in the main caps to the pan rails, and it, it really locks up the bottom of the engine, gets rid of the flex and all the weakness. So all the bearing problems we used to see you know, are going to totally go away with this. I mean, back when I was at TRD, we used to put a high strength steel cap on top of the main caps, and we still had bearing problems. But I mean, this, if you look at it, has a really thick uh, cap to reinforce the cap and prevent it from uh, you know, splitting down the middle or flexing. Uh, it's a really thick, really strong billet steel piece. Ties it into the pan rails. Completely unitizes the bottom end. It's kind of like um, you know, late model high performance engines like VRs that have bed plates. You know, that's one of the reasons why like a VR is so strong, for instance. So if you're building a high revving, high power 4EG, in my opinion, these things are mandatory to get. When you look at our block, uh, you could probably see that we polished the interior of the block and removed like a lot of casting flash and stress risers. Now the cast iron block, a lot of sand gets entrapped in the casting. You don't see this with aluminum blocks, but cast iron in particular, and you wanna like um, go over the surface with a cartridge wheel and get all that entrapped sand out, because that sand could easily break off and circulate around through the motor. So when you, when you look at the block, it's all been deburred and lightly polished inside. All the sharp corners and anything that could be a stress, stress riser has been rounded out with a carbide cutter. Uh, this kind of helps the block not have any areas that could crack, gets, gets rid of entrapped sand, and helps oil return. Uh, we also got rid of the stock bolts, and we put uh, ARP studs. And these are specifically for the 4AG, so they're bottoming type studs with maximum thread engagement. They're all good, solid parts. Um, they're a special length to work with the MRP uh, bed plate or girdle. And, uh, you know, this bottom end's not going to give us any trouble between the SR20 journal size, good journal overlap, strong crank. Um, you know, this is like great stuff. On the valve train side, uh, this is something where we pay particular attention. Now, on this particular engine, we're running some vintage TRD Formula Atlantic cams. Now, these are the biggest cams available for the motor, at least what we know about. They're 320 degrees duration on in the intake and 304 on in the exhaust. Now, you can't buy these anymore, so uh, Kelford actually makes a really good cam, which is uh, 318 on the intake and 304 on the exhaust. And the Kelford cams probably uh, benefit from 
you know, a whole generation of kinematic study and all that. So um, I would probably use Kelfords in lieu of these TRD cams, but this is what we had, and it fits within the uh, owners of the engine's budget. So, um, uh, so remember, if you're going to try to duplicate what we're doing, uh, run Kelford. Um, I kind of think that's the best 4AG cam on the market. Um, to run the 11 grand, we have to do some things in the valve train. Now, um, the first thing we do is we run SuperTech dual valve springs and uh, titanium retainers. These have sufficient tension to run, you know, like 11,000 RPM. Uh, they're electro-polished and shot peen to get rid of all the uh, stress risers. They may have a really good metal, so there's like probably less likely to have inclusions in there that can break. And uh, we WPC and cryo-treat them to help their fatigue life. So that's a really cool deal. The other thing that's really important is the stock 4AG is a uh, shim on top of bucket. So to adjust your valve clearance, you have a shim. And if you run, I don't know, much more than 7.5 millimeters of lift or much more than the stock lift, the cam lobe tends to just wipe the shim out and flip it out. And then when that happens, the uh, cam lobe beats on the uh, retainer and your engine basically blows up, you drop a valve, and you know, what a mess. So to avoid that situation, um, you know, these cams I think are, uh, I believe the TRD cams, I'm getting senile, but I think they're 10.5 millimeters lift. So to avoid that problem, um, we, we use the uh, buckets from a 1SD, like a Yaris motor, and these are select fits, so there's this uh, little nipple in there that's a given height, and Toyota makes them in all different uh, thicknesses. So uh, we use whatever um, Toyota part is needed to get the uh, right valve clearance. So you get rid of um, having uh, any kind of adjustment shim at all, and, and you know it's nothing there. Now, uh, SuperTech also makes a, uh, a um, similar thing, and it's a shim under the bucket. So it's a separate shim that, that fits in this well in the retainer, and that's the select pit fit part that you can get to set the clearance. But, I mean, we made it even simpler by using this OEM Toyota part, and it's only one part. And, of course, we cryo-treat in WPC, the cam, the follower, the spring, especially critical for valve train stuff. I mean, it goes for the whole motor. Uh, we, on this motor, we're WPC treating and cryo treating uh, everything that spins around and rubs and uh, anything that we can reduce the friction on. Um, you know, we've done videos on both cryo treating and the WPC process. So, uh, you know, do a search of our Moto IQ YouTube channel and you can see whole videos about how awesome that stuff is. We're also using hardened SuperTech retainers. Getting a quality retainer is really important. Uh, if your retainer wears or, or does anything and messes up, you drop a valve and that's the end of your engine. So don't try to reuse stock stuff, brand new SuperTech. Um, we're running SuperTech valves. Um, we're running uh, stainless steel on the intake and in canal on the exhaust. Um, the intake valve is 1.5 millimeters bigger than stock. The exhaust is 2 millimeters. Like for our valves and the TRD valves, I think, are 3 millimeters, but this is a whole different cost. Uh, when you go this big, you have to change your valve seats. Uh, so keep that in mind. But uh, these things really need bigger valves, especially if you're building a stroker motor. Now, if you look at the SuperTech valves, you'll notice that the intake valve has a really flat nail head contour. Uh, this really helps flow. And the exhaust valve has like a tulip contour. This really helps flow going out of the motor. Also, the valves come back cut from SuperTech. So the back cut is like a 30 degree cut right here on top of the 45. And that really helps low lift flow. 
Uh, so like if you're building a motor, if you put a 30 degree back cut in stock valves, that's like a secret trick that makes them flow better. But Supertech does that for you. So you don't have to mess with that. As any like really, really built engine, um, adjustable uh, cam pulleys are really important. Uh, you know, we're using HKS, but uh, you know, the MRP is really good. Um, for cam timing, usually uh, we set them pretty tight in 4AGs, like they like a amazingly tight lobe center compared to contemporary motors. I mean, these things were designed a long time ago, so the heads don't flow like a modern head. So we generally set them up on a, maybe like a 102 or even a 100 degree lobe center. Now that's super tight, but you know, remember this engine was designed before most of you were born. I mean, shoot, I was hardly born. Uh, for the cylinder head, uh, Howard, our master engine builder, he ported it by hand. Um, they are CNC heads available. Like um, probably a lot of you can't afford a Howard hand ported head. Uh, Howard ported most of TRD's uh, Formula Atlantic motors. So he was the master that really knows these heads and he ported a lot of hard running motors for TRD. So he knows these heads inside and out. But MRP has a CNC ported head that uh, works really well. So most of you, uh, you're better off with a MRP head that's obtainable and it's a, um, I, I really recommend it. But we have Howard, so most of you guys don't. Uh, if you have us build your engine, Howard's available, but hand porting is very expensive, so you might as well make use of modern technology. Now if you look, there's larger seats. The top part of the seat is blended into the chamber the edges of the chamber are laid back to reduce uh, valve shrouding. And so when the valve is starting to open, the air-fuel mixture has a lot of room to get out, and that really helps your low lift flow. That's one of the reasons why the compression ratio drops from like 12 to 1 to 11.5 or so. Because um, this adds like, like kind of a lot of volume. So if you look at the valve job, it's uh, done on a Newen machine. So that's a CNC valve seat cutter. And the new machine cuts a smooth radius to the 45 seat, and then a smooth radius to the 70 bottom cut. So the air approaching the valve um, has a really smooth like Venturi, and this greatly helps um, like low lift flow. Like we always find a horsepower gain when we go to a new and valve job over something like a 30. Uh, you have to put a lot of hand finishing in the 30 valve job to approach what a new one does. Uh, so if you see the bowls are opened up, like Howard actually opened them up and made them larger, smooth transition into the port. He also profiled around the valve guide, uh, smoothed out the short side radius of both ports. Um, he kind of flattened the, the port floors, so it's kind of like a D shape. and. Um, didn't make the ports huge, but um, super nice, super aerodynamic. Uh, the port splitters are brought way back to give um, you know more port volume without making the port really huge. Um, even by contemporary standards, this is a pretty good porting job. But I mean, Howard probably has 40 hours in this at least, and uh, um, that's pretty expensive. Uh, one of the other things is, um, when you're running the higher lift cams, uh, you have to notch the edges of uh, where the where the cam followers go. Uh, you can see, you know, this is done on a mill, so we notch them so the lobes don't hit in there, which wouldn't be too cool. So a lot of the power's in the head. We spent a lot of time, or at least Howard did. Howard knows what he's doing. There's a lot of hack dudes that port heads and. Um, most of the power to be gained is in the head, so uh, max effort there. Um, some of the other things is we have a OS twin disc clutch with a low inertia flywheel. See how it's all cut out? We did some dynamic balancing, so that's kind of like what these marks here are, are for, from, the balancing. And uh, basically, 
that's it. I mean, if we're to build a similar engine, it would be almost exactly like this, but we would probably use like a different rod and a different, more modern piston design. And of course, we would have a dry sump. But basically, this is everything that we would do. Uh, we would probably use the MRP head. Um, like Howard Stein's valuable, so um, CNC head there, and um, we'd probably be using the slightly larger Ferrero valves, but uh, it would be pretty much like this. So there you have it, your totally killer 4AG build. We're going to do a 20V five valve motor that's done all Moto IQ style. So this will be a motor that I spec'd out, and that ought to be really cool. So if you like this content, you want us to build your motor, go to MotoIQ.com, hit the garage services link and fill that form out, send it in, we'll get back to you. Be sure to subscribe to our channel, give us a like, it really helps us. Go to MotoIQ, we have tons of technical articles, any of you that still read. There's probably years of uh, material there. I don't know, there's thousands and thousands of articles we've been at it for a while. And uh, until next time, uh, Stay tuned, we have a lot more engine stuff coming. See you later.